I get out of the van. I said, hey, bro, you want anything to drink or eat? And he goes, hey, quit calling me fucking bro. I eat your bro. This episode of Chatting with Stacks. I'm your host, Bill Stacks, and today I got he didn't even get out of the truck. That is wild. And I swear to God, bro, that that, that really, really like made me think, is, is this really what I want? You know? And it was just like stupid little shit, like uh all this like last minute crap, you know. Well, how much does it cost to get in a club, you know? And then they're like, oh nothing, you know, nothing. And I'm already prospecting like eight nine months and tell us oh we got a clubhouse tax you got to pay so much of money which was a, it was a lot you know i don't want to give the figure out but it was a lot yeah go, you got to pay that before you brought up for your patch i was thinking why did you tell me that fucking eight months ago i could have been saving money yeah now now in 12 months you're eligible for a vote i'm thinking how am i going to be eligible i have to pay that money so it, I was I was getting it together, getting it together. And I, that's why I did 14 months. Plus, you know, I was like at the house for like three weeks. I couldn't walk, do anything. I had a broken pelvis. Yeah, so we, you, get in, you get into the accident. What happens next? Do you Right. Do you so they kind of, they like put, I didn't have to come to the clubhouse because, you know, I mean, I was pretty messed up, bro. I couldn't even sit on a toilet. Yeah, but you didn't so, even have your patch anymore, right? No. I, I just had I just had a rocker then when that happened. So what they did is they just kind of like like on a loan on your house stacks. They just put it at the end. You know what I mean? Hey, you want to borrow some money? We're gonna put it at the end. And I was like, at first, I was kind of hoping like I got like a free month out of this, you know, laying around. But I didn't, bro. They put it on the end. Yeah. So, and then when the end came, he told me I wasn't cutting it, and. uh it was crazy. And then I tried to come back after a year and he told me, he says, you know, him and I didn't have a problem after that because uh, we talk, him and I would talk cordially, just like you and I are. And he just said, ah, man, Charlie he goes, this one of the guys in the charter, he, he's got an issue with you or something and he don't want you back. And it's got to be unanimous to get voted back in, you know, and I said, well, man, let me go in the backyard with this guy, you know, mix it up. And he goes, I can't let you pound the shit out of this guy. He's a member. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay, man. So we played this game, bro, where, like, I'd see them, and they would just nod their heads to me. And, you know, and deep down inside it, it bothered me because I, I, I was like, man, I want to be one of you guys so bad, you know, and, and I got, like, so I got a lot of shit done on my house and uh, my house was a brand new house that was put out there. So I never got to finish it. And I was falling behind on my house payments because believe me, bro, when they tell you it's your family, the job and in the club, it's bullshit. It's the club, your family and piss on your job. You know, love comes first. It doesn't right. To the right. And I lost four jobs. I lost four job stacks. No, no bullshit in the first year. I was kind of, hey, man, I got to let you go. You, know, you missed too much work. Because they tell you, we're leaving Friday morning for Chicago. Uh, we're leaving for San Francisco you know, on the bikes, man. So, you know, we're blasting off. Just to give you an example, I, I had, when I crashed my bike, it was brand new. 
when they took it to the Harley dealer, they said, man, you changed the speedometer on this thing? For May, June, July, August 28th, I had 19,000 miles on it. Wow. Right. So, you know, I was just like, oh, man, this this is this is just nuts. Yeah, but it's so tough. if you lost your job, you don't how do you how do you how are you getting money to pay for gas and to go on these trips and how do you it was even... hard. It was hard, bro. My my wife worked and my daughter went to work. She just graduated, she graduated. She was graduating in the year I left Wisconsin, which was really was really shitty, man, because you know, I uprooted her, pulled her out of the school that she should have graduated with her class, you know, and the people she knew. Yeah. But I pulled her out of there, and I took her to Minnesota. So she went to a, a school there for, like, the last three, four months, whatever it was. And she got her diploma. And then uh, she went to work over where my wife was working at the time, my ex-wife. And um, they worked together. So, actually, they, they were making the money to make the house payments. And uh, when I could work, I work. You know what I mean? And then I lose a job, and I go try to find another one. It was crazy. Not until they threw me out that th when I get back to the time I told you they, they let me go. I took that huge shit, man, walked out the door like, man, I'm done with this. I was relieved. I went back. I worked on my house. I finished it. I poured the concrete steps. I did everything that you can imagine, caught up my house payments, got a job, and I kept the goddamn job, you know. And I worked there for three years or something like that. And every year I... I, I couldn't come back because that one guy hated me. And then that one guy got in a, a bad bike accident and he had some head injuries to him and they let him go. And when they let him go, uh, I figured, oh, well, now he's gone, you know. But I didn't I didn't want to, like, go knocking on the door. And, the day uh, after, right? <laughs> yeah, right. And, hey. Uh... So I, I didn't really didn't go around, Stax. I really didn't, like, jump on that wagon. And I was in Sturgis. I had my own motorcycle shop for like 19 years. And uh, Pat came out there and one of his bikes was messed up. So we brought it to the shop and my mechanics worked on it. And uh, he said, hey, come on over to camp, uh, the campgrounds where I'm at. He had a big like motor bus, you know. And uh, he said, come over. You know, he said, Let, let's wrap. You and me, let's talk. So we went over. It was a good talk. You know, we, we had a good talk and he said, I want you to come back, Pee Wee. Come on back. And I said, okay. And he said, so when we get back and uh, we have church, I'll have you uh, we'll have you come to church and then you, you, uh, you can stand up in front of everybody and tell them your intentions, you know? I said, okay. Well, in the meantime, before that even happened, Stax, because I was getting that runaround, I was still running around going down to Chicago, hanging out with Mel Chancey all the time. And me and Mel running around being goofy, you know, beating on people in bars and stuff like that, you know, the right people. Yeah. And and we were still doing that thing. And I wasn't even part of the club, bro, but I was doing it because Mel is like my blood brother, you know? Yeah. Like the blood brother because he's he's really close to me. We talk every day. He just hit me up today. I'm going to go visit him. And, yeah, he's uh, a great guy. Oh, he is. And he just hit me up today and – uh yeah, he cracks me up. So uh, Mel was trying to, uh, you know, he was trying to get me to go to Chicago to come there, transfer there. But you always got to go back to where you start to get permission to go somewhere else. So I still had to go in front of that room. You know what I mean? Yeah. In the meantime, Mel catches a case. They send him to prison. So that kind of like dropped the bucket right there. You know what I mean? It, those other guys wouldn't have fought for me like Mel would have. And um, I was like, now what? And then I ran into one of the Frisco guys, and I always got along great with Frisco, San Francisco. Yeah. And they were like, why don't you come out here, man? I says, yeah. Can I? I was I was worried about, was I going to make it out there? or Because, you know, the cost of living is like living in New York. So I says, uh so you, you guys would. So I went to their I went to their church, you know, to their meeting, and they all said, "Hey, we'll take you, man." They all agreed on it. They said, "At this uh, point, did you have a bottom rocker?" No, no, I was you nobody. Had... I, I was nothing. I was nothing. So I said, "Okay." I said, "Let me, let me, let me go to this, let me go to this meeting thing with Pat, 
and I'll tell them that I, I, I want to move on and move from Minnesota to uh, San Francisco. And it was kind of a weird thing, Stax, because I showed up that Thursday for their church. And we're waiting, we're waiting. No Pat. No Pat. He never shows up. So they come on and he told me, hey, Pat's not here. You don't feel good. So uh, we're just going to go hanging out and hit some, you know, some titty bars and stuff. So you want to go with us, you can. But other than that, uh, it's best if you just come back next week. I'm thinking, okay. So in the meantime, you know, Ralph already quit. The big guy I told you about. Yeah. Ralph, he already quit. He did like five years and he quit. And, and, and that's within 94, 95, 96, 97, 98. So this is, yeah, this is like 1999, uh, 99, 1999, actually. So he, um, I went over to his house and I said, man, what do you think is going on? He told me, listen, dude, Pat's going to screw you some way. Get the hell out of there. And I said, man, I'm trying to save us some money. I, I got to take this trip. I got. I had a cargo van. I put my motorcycle in it, all my shit. And uh, it sounds pretty selfish of me. And it was. I, uh, you know, my my two kids were there, and and my ex-wife at the time. She she was my wife at that time, but. I told him, hey, I'm going to go to Frisco. I'm going to do this thing. Let me do it on my own because it was too hard with the family. And she was taking care of the household pretty much on her own. You know, yeah. I think back on it now, what a huge mistake it was. And I shouldn't have done it because it mentally really, really fucked up her head, man. Bad. It did. Uh, I didn't know, uh, you know, she had like a nervous breakdown on it and. And uh, it was just me being selfish, man. You know, I didn't, I didn't think about anybody else. It was just like, man, I'm going to be a hell's angel. And then later I seen the consequences of how bad it was. And uh, it, it, uh, it was a, it was a down, downfall in my life at that time. But, you know, when I got to, I got to Frisco, well, first of all, let me get back to telling you. So the next, uh, Ralph says, get out of here, man. And he hands me $2,000. I said, what's this for? And he goes, here. I says, oh, I don't know. I could pay it back. He goes, I don't want you to pay me. I'm giving it to you. Get out of here. He was going to give me this big gold bracelet, but naturally, you know, not even handcuffs fit my wrist, you know? Yeah. That's a big wrist. Yeah. So, <laughs> so here, just take the two grand and go to California and live your dream. Do what you want to do, Pee Wee. Live out your dream. And if it ain't what you want, then, you know, you always know that you did it. I said, okay, man. So the next week comes, I go to church again. You believe this, bro? Pat doesn't show again. Yeah, again. Is, is this the time he's cooperating? Um, no, 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 no. He wasn't. He wasn't cooperating then. And then I thought, son of a bitch. But they called me in the room anyway, so that was good. And I went in the room, and they said, you want to come back? And I said, yeah. It was like in October. And they said, when do you want to start? I said, how about the first of the year, a fresh start, you know? And they said, all right. And I said, but I want to, I want to transfer. I want to go to, I want to go to Frisco. And they just were like, you know, what? A couple of the guys in the back were like this. Hey, you got a place for me to stay when I come there, right? I said, you got it, man. So they go, we got to think about this. Uh, we're going to call Frisco right now and ask him. So they call Frisco, and Frisco goes, hell yeah, we'll take, we want him. We're taking him. So he goes, I wow. got to call Pat, ask Pat. He asked Pat. Pat says, let him go. So it was off to San Francisco I went, you know. And my my son at the time, Brad, he, he rode with me in the van, and it was sad. I had to put him on the plane to fly him back. And, and the saddest part about it was, like, uh, the way I put it in my book, uh, Stacks, I put it like, you know, putting him on the plane, flying back, it was like sending the last personal thing of mine, you know, of my family away. It was like, shoot, yeah. go, you know? And that's how I felt, man. I mean, I could feel that, man, my heart was broke, you know? And uh, I put him on the plane, he flew back, and then I started doing my, they made me hang around for like, 
two months, three months, two months, I think it was. Before you got your prospect patch. Right. Then I got my prospect patch. And and then, you know, when I made, when I made member there, it meant a lot because they're the second charter ever of Hell's Angels, you know. So that's a that that's a that's a big deal, bro. You know? Yeah. Like you're you're like history right there. Well, one was the one of the first ones. San Bernardino, Purdue. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they were they were yeah. first and then Frisco. And uh, that's why you've seen all the Purdue guys and the Frisco yeah. guys on the stage in Altamont, you know? Yeah. So um yeah, the night they called me in, um it was pretty cool, you know. They, they they called me up into the room and they had me like like a little flustered, bro. You know, I'm standing there, and you always got to watch what you say, man, because you know sometimes you uh, slip of the tongue and say something stupid, man, and boom, you're gone. And so I got up there and I thought I was getting like uh, reamed out for something uh, or something I did. And I and I came up there and. Um, they were yelling about something, and it's so long ago that I really, honestly, God, I can't remember exactly what it was about. And they were they were yelling, and um, and one guy stands up, and it was Tony, who I'm, he's out of the club now, but I'm still great, great friends with him. He's 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 still my brother, you know. And we talk, and Tony says to me, uh, "Hey, uh, what would you have told that guy?" They were talking about me talking to this other guy that they sent down the road and they didn't want me to talk to him. And he goes, what, what could you say to that guy that you, you, that you shouldn't have, you know, being, being a hell's angel. I stood there for a minute and I'm thinking, Oh, what, what, what does he mean? Being a hell's angel. Oh, maybe he's thinking, or he's saying to me, like if you were one, why? Right. right. Or when I become one. So that's what I'm thinking. And I said, well, you know, uh, and I was kind of like dumbfounded. I was like, uh, you know, trying to think of what, how to say it. And he looks at me again, real serious. And he goes, you're a hell's angel. What the hell would you say? And I looked at him again, like, the fuck are you saying, man? And all of a sudden, he reaches behind him and pulls out a patch, shoves it in my face, and he goes, congratulations, now you're in, you know? And uh, it felt like, you know, like like almost like winning state championship wrestling again, you know? Yeah. I was like, yeah. And it was funny, bro, because the guy the guy who get, uh, gave me the vest to put on, he wasn't, he was, he was a big guy, but he wasn't as big as me, you know? I, I got a big 60-inch chest, you know? So yeah. I would have put on his vest, and it's like up about here, you know. <laughs> I, I couldn't put it together with unless I had like straps, but it was right here, bro. I didn't give a shit. I was doing a fat guy in a little coat, you know. I was just happy I was one. And they're like, "Come on, we're gonna go party!" So we all jumped on the bikes and we went down to the Cats Club, which is like a famous club in in San Francisco. We went down there. We partied there all night and. Shit, I think I left there about four o'clock in the morning or some shit like that. And then we went to the clubhouse and I lived in the back of the clubhouse. I had an apartment in the back, so I had far to go, you know? Yeah. But yeah, it was, it was a pretty cool feeling. And uh, to make you laugh, one of the things, there was a, there was a brother from uh, Long Island, big guy, big guy. And they call him Big Rod, right? He, he was a big, he was as big as me, bro. Just from... I guess that California lingo, you know, where we all, hey, bro, hey, bro. We're always saying, bro, bro. So he came there for a funeral, and I was a prospect. And I had to drive him to this funeral. And I get, I get out of the van. I said, hey, bro, you want anything to drink or eat? And he goes, hey, quit calling me fucking bro. I eat your bro. <laughs> and I said, well, it's just. The way I talk, man. And he goes, well, you ain't a member and you ain't my bro. So don't call me that. So yeah, so we, we go to do something else. And I walked over and I remember when we got there, he was still sitting like in the van, but everybody's like jumping out and going to the, to the, you know, up to where the casket was and everything. It was a funeral we were going to. And uh, this guy got killed on a motorcycle, uh, another member. And, uh, I walked over to Van and I said, hey, bro, everybody's walking up there. He goes, I told you not to call me, bro. <laughs> and, 
and I was thinking to myself, well, me and his big boy got to fight. We're going to fight, you know, but that's just the way it is. I wasn't doing it disrespectfully. It's just the way I talk. Yeah. So I'm at the clubhouse. You're going to die, man. I just made member, right? The phone rings. I pick it up. Frisco. And that's how they always answer the phones, whatever state they were, right? Or charter. So I pick up the phone. I go, Frisco. He goes, yeah, this is uh, this is Big Rod from Long Island. I'm uh, calling up there. I, I need to talk to someone. And he, I forget who he asked to talk to. And I said, oh, I said, this is Pee Wee, bro. He goes, hey. And I go, hey, before you start bitching, I made a member yesterday, you know, or uh, tonight, tonight. That's what it was, which was the next day, actually. But I said, I made a member last night. And he goes, oh, congratulations, brother. <laughs> God, 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 it was a trip, man. Yeah, but, fun. yeah, and then him and I got along great after that. But yeah, he wasn't on the bro thing, you know. But yeah, I, I used to do like stupid shit. Uh <laughs> I'm like I'm only laughing, bro, because now I think back on it. Some of the shit was pretty funny. They have another guy, his name was Stevie. He's he got kicked out of the club, and uh he was a real dickhead, you know. And he came to uh, Frisco and he got a big tattoo on uh, on his forearm. I, I can't remember what the fuck it is, was, but uh, one of the one of the friends of Frisco, a big bodybuilder guy, comes walking over, and here we go again with that 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 California lingo, okay? And he walks over and he goes, "Hey, man, did you see my new tattoo?" And he shows it to him, and I'm standing on the other side of him. And he looks at Stevie's arm, and Stevie's a member. He was from uh, Indiana. And he looks at his arm, and the dude goes, that thing's fucking sick. He walks away. And Stevie starts doing this. Like, what the hell did he mean by that? You know, because he went, that's sick. And he walked away. And I said, yeah, that just means, you know, it just means it's like sick. It's badass, man, you know. It's yeah. cool. He digs your tattoo, you know? And he goes, you guys got like weird lingo up here in California. And I said, yeah, you know? So I says like, uh, and believe me, bro, I was still a prospect when I said this to him. Hmm. But yeah, he was very thought. I says, you know, so like, you know, like a lot of times when we're joking around and shit, because it's Frisco, you know, don't like freak out because this is just like a joke thing. Like if I say to you, Instead of I yell, hey, Stevie, and I yell, hey, f you know, it's, it's just a joke thing, you know? He goes, you better not call me. <laughs> I just started laughing. I thought I'd try to get away with it, you know, bro? Because I would have called him that all day. <laughs> How much of a difference was it hanging out up in Minneapolis compared oh, to? Oh, day and night. Day and night, bro. Day and night. Day and night. You know? They were like. I, I wouldn't get like no 45 minute lectures about stocking a cooler full of beer or anything like that. Matter of fact, it was funny. They were saying, Hey man, our cooler's taking a shit. And we had like a small cooler. It was like, like the size of a refrigerator, you know, and we're stacking that in there. We had a huge clubhouse. It was huge, bro. It was a classic, classic, classic clubhouse that had uh, members bikes in the walls, in the walls, embedded in the walls, like in shrines, wow. with all their stuff around it. It was it was really cool, bro. I mean, it, it would almost be like it would almost be like a museum for you to go yeah. in and see. That's how cool it was. These guys they didn't play any of that the the cooler games, right? So getting back to the cooler, they said, "Hey, Pee Wee man, uh, our cooler's taking a, shit. you know, if you see one cheap or something." Uh, let us know because we're going to have to buy a new cooler or something. So I come around the corner down the street on my bike. So you got to go like up the street on Tennessee street. That's where the clubhouse is. So you go up to the top of the hill and you turn right. There's like a, like a little, uh, I don't want to say seven 11, but that's what, it, that's what it's like a seven 11, like but it was a little growth. Yeah. A little grocery store and it was being remodeled inside you were gutting the store and all this was tarped out in front of it right <laughs> so i turned the corner and i'm looking at it and i see this big big like 
probably uh, eight feet by 10 high, big old cooler, big giant one. And I'm thinking, oh, shit, we got to have that. So I went down to the clubhouse, man, and I uh, I got uh, a couple four-wheel dollies that we had in the back room. I went over, and I had to lay that thing on its side, bro, and I had to fucking roll it down the hill. And I'm telling you, this hill was steep. And I think when it got away from me, and it almost did twice, and I was trying to, whoa, it's taking off, and, and it weighed it weighed so much. There was no way I could have stopped it from flipping over if it was going to flip. Yeah, That's how heavy it was. I got it down to the end of the road, and we had a big garage door. I opened it up, wheeled it in, took the old cooler out, put the new one in, let it sit for a while. I put all the beer in it. All the it was stacked. They all came in. We're like, where the hell did that come from? <laughs> and one of the guys in the club worked for Budweiser. So anytime, you know, he would go into a store, stacks, and they say, oh, uh, this beer is outdated. You know what I mean? Well, really, is beer outdated, bro? No. Guys can have beer. Yeah, the guys have beer in a garage for two, three years. You're drinking it. You know? Yeah, yeah. You don't even know. This shit just, like, last month, it it, it expired. It, it doesn't expire. It's just, you know, they can't, they can't leave it in the store. So he would always bring, man, we had so much Budweiser and that shit. We never paid for beer. Never. And that, that guy that worked for Budweiser, um, his name was Anthony, and uh, that sick bastard. He uh, he ended up uh, killing his uh, two kids, his wife and himself. Why? Yeah, suicidal. He killed them first, and then he shot himself. You're in San Francisco. Where do you go from there? And how long do you stay there? And was there any big events that happened in your life when this was happening? And did you go back to Minnesota? And what was it like when you went back to Minnesota? Believe this, bro. I went back to Minnesota when Pat got busted on it on on his uh on his federal case. They gave him 20 years. He had a going away party. And I went to his going away party and I seen uh there was there was people all kinds of people, other clubs were there. Um uh, club I love dearly, the Hell for Sterols. You know, they're big in the Midwest, they're big. They're a big 1% club, you know, and they started way back in, uh, like, 62. Yeah, I've heard and those guys that. are still my friends to this day. You know, I, I love them. Uh, they're they're great. They're a true brotherhood, you know. And they were there. I see one of their members give Pat a nice nice gold ring and, you know, say, hey, man, it's bad this is happening to you. And we're all there hanging out with them, and Pat looks at me, and he says, Charlie, you forever forgive me for what I did to you, you know, running me down the road, but now I was a hell's angel, right? California one. And I said, well, you know, Pat, I already forgave you because I came to your uh, going away party. Uh, obviously, I'm not holding a grudge. Or I wouldn't have came.